Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 150, CanCon, spending $50 Canadian on board games. I'm Sean, and with me as always, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. This episode is sponsored by Crowd Games. Be sure to check out City of the Great Machine, a one-verse mini steampunk-themed board game with some really awesome-looking minis, relaunching on Kickstarter on the day this episode goes live, October 19th. For those here live, you can head over to the Kickstarter page and follow it now so you get notified when it launches. All right, so tonight what we are talking about is spending money at the local game store. We've got a question from a local Windsor gamer who happens to have a gift certificate from one of our local game stores and is looking for games to buy with that gift certificate. And I thought it'd be interesting to not only share the suggestions with uh, with Dave, but also with the rest of you. And what I thought would make it even more fun is we'll do that. But then after that, Sean and I are both going to go shopping and share what we would buy with a $50 gift certificate. Now, after that, I do also have a short review today, and that is on Yardmaster, a game you can get for free. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Well, let's start off with a comment from another board game creator, Envy Gaming, who commented... Content creator content creator who commented on our uh, topic of ugly games that play great. We have this on our list of top tens to do eventually, but I'll definitely pick a few. Lagrange, Castles of Burgundy, and Santa Maria. Lagrange is a good one. That's one I didn't think of when we were doing our episode. I got to say it is one of the most bland looking games ever made. Um, kind of fits the theme of Stronghold games. We had a couple of their games on the list uh, as well. Uh, but great game. They, they like one of the first games to really deep dive the multi-use cards and did some neat stuff with the boards where they were cut out. So depending on the, where you put cards, you can see different parts of them. Great game. Terrible looking. Now, Santa Maria isn't one I played, so I can't comment on that one. And well, Castles of Burgundy, I don't remember if it was the top, but I know it was near the top of our list. Thanks for the comment. And I got to say, thank you for the great YouTube content. You all might want to check out NV Gaming. It's E-N-V-Y Gaming on YouTube. Well, next, on that same topic of ugly games, we've got a comment from Shanoan, Shanodin, who says, ooh, I can't watch right now, but my first thought is Urban Sprawl, Mm. an absolutely superb game with an absolutely non-existent (laughs) art style. Seriously, it's awful. I think this game would be a classic if it had tried a little harder. Well, thanks for the comment, Shinoden. Um, This game's been on my wish list for years, actually. It's one I want to get out uh, because I like heavier games. It's from GMT Games, who tend to make nice, heavy stuff, mostly war games. And I've been tempted to pick it up. It's just because I also dig city building. I think city building is actually an underused theme in board games. There are some out there, but not a ton of them. And I love city building, especially going back to computer games like SimCity and this such. But I got to say, you're right. Every time I look at this game, one of the reasons I don't pull the trigger is that it it just looks bad. I like the look and aesthetic of this game is not doing it any favors. Now, it is GMT Games who are known for Hex Encounter War Games. And I think that's part of what's happening here is you have a war game publisher trying to publish a Euro and sticking to their, you know, um, cadre of, of, of artists that tend to do just war games. There. Well, finally, Samantha Bryant has this to say about our ugly games topic. Great theme. I do confess I am less likely to try a game that doesn't look good. Part of what I enjoy in games is the art of them, too. But I have played and enjoyed Suburbia and Dominion, and some of these others linger unplayed on our shelves. Yeah, I know a ton of people out there that like to claim that looks don't matter. All that matters in a game is the actual gameplay. And I've got to say, I disagree somewhat. While gameplay can be huge, and and is probably the biggest aspect of a game, the graphic design, theme, and artwork can be enough to ruin a good game. While the games we mentioned are good enough that we overlook some of the visual problems, to be honest, the ones we're complaining about really aren't horrible. They're not absolutely terrible. They're just not great. 
Now, there are games out there that actually ruined by their graphic design, but we don't like to dunk on games here. We like to talk about the games we love. Well, next, quick comment from patron of the show, Courtney Jackson, in regards to our Gorinto coverage. Mo Tuzniel, you were definitely right about this one. Fantastic <laughs> game. I'm glad it's been a hit for you too, Courtney. Um, know what I was really happy to see is when Gen Con hit, Mark Spector was there showing off Garinto when it sold out on the second day of Gen Con, which that's awesome and bad news in a way, but it's awesome that it sold out for them. It sucks they didn't produce enough copies, but I love the fact that this game is throwing out. I really do think Garinto is worth picking up. It is by far the best abstract game I played since Azul. I really dig that game. All right, well, finally, a couple of comments on our Quacks of Quedlinburg review from last show. John Simantov writes, One of my current favorites. Some of my more serious gamer friends hate randomness. I love it and drink their tears. <laughs> Next up, Cindy Robertson writes, That's a solid review. The game is a solid game, and you nailed the good and the bad. Nice. I hope you get a chance to play the expansions. I think that they had, they both add a lot to the game without making it more complicated. Something that a lot of people don't think about when playing is that you know how many cherry bombs you have of each value. Mm -hmm. Even though you can't look in your bag, you can count how many ingredients you have left and compare that to what's in your pot. Early game, I generally don't worry about exploding unless I really want a ruby that I'm about to get. Mid game, I play very close attention to what's in my bag, focus on two or three ingredients, Late game, especially the last round, I tend to push until I explode unless I did a great job on buying my ingredients and I'm close to winning. The expansions change up how you want to play. I recommend them both. Well, thanks for the comments, John and Cindy. Um, yes, ingredient counting is a big part of playing Quacks of Quedlinburg well. Though I'm not sure about that exploding on the last round strategy. I, that makes me wonder if you're forgetting a rule there. Remember when you convert... In the last round, you convert any gold you earn to points. And I guess in most games, you're usually up in the 20 to 25 to 30 points on your bowl. So you're looking at four to six points that late in the game. So I don't know about that one. I, I, I personally, the last round is one of the rounds I never want to explode unless I'm way far behind and I'm trying to catch up. Now, Deanna would also point out that you can know exactly what's in your bag, know everything perfectly memorized and still managed to pull out three cherry bombs followed by a two cherry bomb followed by another two cherry bomb as your first three pulls even in the last round of the game when you've got 30 bag ingredients in your bag all right well that's it for this week's comments send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media we're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions Today's question comes from David Hutchinson, a local Windsor gamer who wrote, Mr. Bellhop, I am looking to buy a board game for my friends, and I must buy it at Brimstone Games on account of my sister buying me a gift certificate from them. I'm looking for a cooperative game or a competitive game that is not so cutthroat. Do you have any recommendations for a game, and do you know any sites that I can visit to do further research? Thank you in advance for your help. Signed. Happy gamer. Happy gamer. Dave is a happy gamer. He's like, so like out of everyone we ever gamed with, he's like the most just kind of happy go lucky, just there to have fun. Always a friendly face. Well, thanks for the question, Dave. Um, so what Dave's looking for, he's got a $50 gift certificate and he's got to spend it at a specific store. So for those of you who do want to play along in the chat, I did give you a link to that store's board game selection. He is looking for a board game specifically. He did say I'm looking to buy a board game. So we're not even going to look at RPGs or anything like that. We're just going to look at board games. And now um, he's going to use a gift certificate. So what I did is I went on their site and all I looked at was their site and what was currently in stock. I didn't touch anything else. Um, now, Dave, since I actually sent him this, because I knew he couldn't join us tonight, and Dave was like, oh, no, it could be stuff. I'll order in stuff. And I'm like, well, that's a whole different question. That's, that's <laughs> like, what cooperative games can I get for under 50 Canadian, which would have been a totally different topic, but I didn't have time to backpedal at this point. So we're going with that. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend Dave's completely broke. Like, all he has is this gift certificate. So for this list, he's got this gift certificate. He's going to go spend 50 bucks. And what should he buy? So the first thing I spotted is he's looking for something cooperative. So what I will note is that the, the group he games with is highly competitive to the point that it can become a problem during game nights. They, they, they get argumentative. 
So fair enough. They realize this about themselves. So it's always good. Like they've talked about this and they know they can, they can get heated discussions can get heated when they play competitive games. So they try to stick to cooperative games. So that makes perfect sense. So my number one recommendation, and, and I know Dave doesn't have this one yet is flashpoint fire rescue. Second edition at brimstone. That'll run you 45 99. So you got a little bit left, but not, I couldn't find anything for like four bucks on their site like even a said that uh, nothing on their website like otherwise i'd say like throw in a d20 or something too right pick up a die so flashpoint we've mentioned many times on the show before this is a cooperative game where you play firefighters trying to save um civilians i guess uh, uh, people from a burning building the board comes with two different sides there is a scaling difficulty level where you have like the easy family game which is actually fairly simple and reminds me of pandemic where you just have four actions every round that include things like using your axe to hack down doors and putting out fires and dragging bodies. And then there's an advanced version where you can get stuff like the ambulance to get to different sides or so the fire truck to get to different parts of the building. And someone can be on the fire truck and use the fire hose. And like, it's way more complicated. And I honestly think with that group, you're going to want to step it up to that advanced version of the game pretty much right away. Right. So my first recommendation at $45.99 would be Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Uh, technically, it's on the second edition. Now, next up, a great game to work together with people and to also show off a really fantastic game system from mm -hmm. friends uh, Jay and uh, Sen, uh, Jay Cormier and Sen Fulong, or Sen Fuling Lim, the Coded Chronicles game Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. Now, we talked mm -hmm. about this game while the follow-up Shining didn't uh, shine as well in our eyes. No. Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion was a fantastic cooperative romp through both Scooby-Doo and a uh, escape uh, room. And that one's only at $34.99. So with that, you can add in the game for $13.59 to fill out your $50 gift card. Yeah, I think Scooby-Doo would be great for this group. Uh, just because they're all role players and there are definitely role playing elements of that game, especially if people get into character and read out their passages as the various characters in the game. And I can totally see that group doing it. And then the game we've talked about on the show before, it sounds simple enough. You are trying to play your cards in order going from one to a hundred or a hundred to one. Uh, but you're not allowed to talk. So you're, this isn't, sorry, that sounds more like the mind. You're, you're, you're playing cards onto a pile. You're not allowed to talk about the cards in your hands. You are allowed to socialize and talk and you're trying to get the cards. So you play them in order with a neat rule that if you use something that's exactly 10 apart, you can jump backwards or forwards, depending on which one you're trying to go through on. Like if you're trying to go up, you can jump back. And if you're trying to go down, you can jump up. Really easy, simple to learn, good filler game. And my only issue, and I have no idea how Dave's particular group would feel about this, is Scooby-Doo is only playable once. So if they are looking for a game, they're going to get to the table multiple times. I'm so, so on Scooby-Doo. This is a one-time experience, but I do think they'll have fun with it, especially with Halloween coming up. And I know you're not, most people are probably not going out this year, may or may not be giving out candy. Um, I know that group of gamers is probably not old enough to go out trick-or-treating themselves. So this would be something great for them to play while waiting for kids to show up at the door. Absolutely. All right, the next one I have is the surprisingly cheap Galaxy Trucker. The new printing of Galaxy Trucker that was just released from CGE is only $30.59. That is an incredible price for Galaxy Trucker. That's thirty fifty nine Canadian. So I would get them Galaxy Trucker, and then with the leftover money, I would get D&D &D Dungeon Mayhem. Now, yes, I know it's not cooperative. It's a competitive game, but it's a light filler card game. And I know Dave's group are huge fantasy RPG fans that are well-versed in the world of Dungeons & Dragons. I do know their particular D&D &D of choice would be Rollmaster, but I know they know all the tropes of D&D &D and would get a kick out of that game. It's a light, fluffy game with a bunch of D&D tropes. Now, Galaxy Trucker is a, another silly game, right? Both of these are very lighthearted. In Galaxy Trucker, you are getting together and you are, like, on your own, building a spaceship. And you're drafting tiles to build this spaceship, and then you go out and you go fly the ship to your destination and hope it doesn't blow up on the way. And that's half the fun is meteors come in and you get attacked by aliens and all kinds of horrible things happen. And whoever ship gets to the destination in the best shape 
wins the round. He played multiple rounds, earning money for each section that makes it back. Extra points for collecting cargo on the way and so on. Again, not cooperative. But the only cutthroatness is maybe drafting a tile someone before someone else. But the tiles are all face down. Like you're literally flipping them over. And if you don't want them, you leave them face up. It's really hard to screw someone over in a game of Galaxy Trucker. It's more of an independent see what happens kind of game. So I think it's on the competitive side, but I think it'd be great for this group just for the silliness factor. Fair enough. Now, next up, we've got a choice to make. And this could be that one of those choices that breaks up a group or everyone all gets together. So we have two legendary encounters boxes to choose from, mm -hmm. both right up there at the tip of the uh, allowable. And actually, one of them is normally above, but it's on discount it's right on sale. Now. So we can go with Legendary Encounters X-Files for $49.79. Or if you want something a little more quirky and a little less serious, Big Trouble in Little China for $49.27. All depending on which way your group tends to uh, veer. Yeah, with this particular group of gamers, I couldn't tell you if there are more X-Files fans or Big Trouble in Little China fans. What I did learn is they are absolutely not Star Wars fans, because I had a Star Wars game on this list, and Dave was like, hell no. I'm like, all right, <laughs> don't like that one. So the Legendary Encounters games, unlike the Legendary Marvel game, are actually cooperative. They are not competitive. They are not a game where you kind of work together to beat the boss, but someone wins. No, and these ones, they are cooperative. Except Big Trouble in Little China decided to throw a big battle royal at the end of it just to prove who's the most badass, which I thought was an odd choice. That's a no, unique not aspect to that game. It fits the theme. <laughs> it fits yeah, the yeah. theme. Yep. So in both these games, you are working together to fight enemies coming down a track. If you played any of the legendary games, you know what these are like. I do know this group are big card gamers. They are fans of uh, adventure card games. Uh, they have played through the Pathfinder adventure card game, and they did the Shadowrun adventure card game, and they did the D&D &D one that's based on the Shadowrun one, which I can't remember the name of. So I think these kind of card games are right up their alley. And to be honest, Dave is the person who taught me Marvel Legendary. And one of the things he hated was that competitive, cooperative nature of the game. So strip that out, except for the weird-ass fight at the end of Big Trouble Little China. And I think these are a great recommendation. Fair enough. Now, the last one I've got for Dave is going out on a limb here. I have no idea how this would go over with their group. Um, and that is the Telestrations 12-player party pack, which I wish I owned because I only have the eight-player version. I wish I had the 12-player version. More books and better markers come in that. Mine has the big, fat blech, markers that are so hard to draw with. These have little fine point ones, which are still hard to draw with, but they're easier. Uh, that comes in at only $44.59. Again, pick up some card sleeves or some dice or something to go with it. Um, this could be great. Uh, th this is the game I, I don't think any other game in my entire collection I have laughed so much at, at, at while playing. Uh, most of the time, that's probably because it's at 3 a.m., but like I have broke this out at New Year's or in the middle of an afternoon and played it. The game always has laughs. Um, well, yes, it does reward some drawing ability but that's not the important thing the important thing is being able to get a message across in a short period of time so illustration the drawing game it's a party game this group sometimes i think needs something like this after they play that competitive game and everyone wants to kill each other they should all just sit down and play telestrations the 12 player party pack and relax after a, a rousing game of something more competitive absolutely yeah, uh, telestrations. Uh, we will, and then now uh, this is telestrations, not telestrations upside drawn. Telestrations, mm -hmm. twelve player party pack, not other telestrations. Oh, wow, I, <laughs> I, I, no, I'm, I'm picturing some people in that game group playing telestrations upside drawn, and I, I cannot recommend that one. So now we, we kind of made this artificial in a way, right? Because who has a gift certificate? And no extra money, right? Like gift certificate, fifty dollars gift certificate means fifty dollars off. Not I can only spend fifty dollars. So my actual biggest recommendation for Dave is to spend some of his own cash. Actually, not a small amount of his own cash, but would be to pick up the Marvel Champions box set, the big new living card game from Fantasy Flight, where you get a number of heroes in the box and a number of villains, and every hero has their own deck 
that's themed to them with unique abilities to that hero. Like the Ant-Man deck has you play a tableau where it builds and grows. Like that's just fantastic. There's some really great stuff here. This is considered by many the best um, living card game published so far. It is cooperative. You each pick your hero and you pick a villain to fight against. I know Dave's group was a huge fan of other adventure card games, and I think this is kind of the Marvel next step to that. I think this is, rating-wise and popularity, a step above the Shadowrun game and the Pathfinder one. This seems to have more staying power. Now, the other one I would recommend is Jaws of the Lion for Gloomhaven, because I know they finished Gloomhaven. And like they finished Gloomhaven, like like they they did the main story and then went back and they unlocked every character type and they picked up the the fallen circle or whatever the thing I haven't picked up the actual expansion for Gloomhaven. I think jumping back and then doing Jaws of the Lion could be a lot of fun for this group, especially because it's lighter, it, it's less quarterbacking, it's less arguing and less optimization. I think it'd be more fun for this group than Gloomhaven even was. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, there's definitely, uh, you know, some strength to, even if you have finished Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion is still a good game. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just no reason to ignore it, even though technically it's the precursor to, uh, and That's we do, and we do recommend, we do recommend people buy Jaws of the Lion first because of the totally onboarding, is. but there's no reason you can't go back to it after finishing Gloom. The other one I would recommend too is I know they played some of the Pandemic Legacies. I don't know which. So whatever the next one is, I would also right. recommend because Pandemic Legacy Season 2 is significantly different from Season 1 and Season 0, which is actually the third game, but is actually a prequel, kind of like Jaws of the Lion, is completely different. Like it, it barely uses the pandemic mechanics. That's another one I think you that group could all enjoy playing together. But again, it's over the $50 mark. That's a, that's a, you're going to have to spend some extra money. So next up, we decided we were going to see what we would spend for $50. Yeah. You know, if we had if we had a $50 uh, gift certificate burning a hole in our pockets, where would we go to uh, and what would we pick up from Brimstone? And to be honest, I wish I had a $50 gift certificate <laughs> right now because there's some stuff here I would definitely buy. Yeah. No, so absolutely. the first one I found when looking for games for Dave and I would have recommended for him until I found out they are not Star Wars fans, which I, I don't know what's going on there, <laughs> um, is the Unlock Star Wars game. So the Unlock games are escape room in a box games that are card driven and app driven where you're scanning cards and doing stuff. I admit I have not played one. I tried. I, I reached out to them and said, look, I've been reviewing Exit Games from Ravensburger. Let me compare your games to Exit. And they, they weren't willing to work with us. I think because we were in Canada. It wasn't like they don't like me. And well, what they started doing is they were the games used to be, I think they were $10 each, but they were smaller than the Exit Games. Well, what they've done now is they bundle them in groups of three. And I, again, $10 would have been, I think, maybe they were 15 each, whatever. They're, they were slightly cheaper than Exit Games with smaller boxes. Well, now they package them three at a time. And originally, they released as an EU exclusive a Star Wars three pack. So three different Star Wars exit games all in one box. Well, that's finally, it seems, over here in North America, because, well, at least Brimstone can get a copy for $47.99. So that only leaves you with two bucks and a penny left. Uh, I couldn't find anything on the site at that price point to, to, that I would have picked up. So I'd have $2 and a cent off the next time I'm in there if I want to buy a chocolate bar for playing games or something. So my number one pick, actually, to be honest, these aren't in any order. My number one pick is actually probably the next one. Uh, one of the things I would consider picking up is the Unlock Star Wars 3-pack. Now, for me, the first thing that I caught my mind, and this, again, these aren't in order. These aren't favorite or anything. But the first sort of $50 combo that, uh, that caught my mind was a combination of Sushi Go, mm -hmm. uh, because I've just been playing that a lot. And I think that's something that the family would probably throw down and play just light and easy all the time. Uh, so Sushi Go, along with One Deck Dungeon. Uh, I do play the digital version, but I would actually really enjoy, like to play yeah. the physical version of it um, and, and explore that one as well. So One Deck Dungeon for $26.59 and Sushi Go for $19.99 gives you uh, $46.58. So you got a little bit of change left over. Pick up some dice. Yep. All right, the next one kind of goes back to uh, our questions, our, our, our suggestion box at the top of the episode. 
uh, for those of you listening to the full episode of our podcast here or watching it on YouTube. Um, and that is the Quacks of Quedlinburg, the Alchemist expansion. Now, honestly, I would have went with the Herb Witches expansion, but it was currently out of stock. So I couldn't put that one on my list. So I said this was as of their stock status on the website this morning and yesterday because I was on both days. So the Alchemist expansion for Quacks of Quedlinburg, which runs $45.59. So it leaves me with $4.41 left over to, I don't know, uh, pick up some dice or a dice bag or something. Um, I, I want all the expansions for Quedlinburg. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, Alchemists can be standalone. Like you can use just Alchemists in Quedlinburg. You don't need Herb Witches to be able to use Alchemists. So this would tie me over till Christmas when hopefully I'll get Herb Witches. There you go. And now the next one, I was realizing, you know, we've talked about Sushi Go in this show many times. But everyone always says, if you're going to get Sushi Go, you should get Sushi Go Party. Mm -hmm. But it's a little more expensive. So if you're going to go with Sushi Go Party, get something else a little fun and go with the Mind. So for the Sushi Go Party at $33.99 and the Mind at $13.99, that comes out to $47.98. And uh, that isn't even many uh, sleeves left at that rate. No. I suddenly feel like we're on prices right all of a sudden. With the, <laughs> the, who's closest to the price without going over? Uh, next one for me is a game I have wanted since the first time I got to try it, which was a demo at Breakout Con. Uh, Sean tried it, I think, at the exact same time. Didn't we yeah, I never down? actually tried it. I oh, never it was got, Deanna. Yeah. Deanna and I sat down and then and did a demo of it. And that is Planet from Blue Orange Games. This is a game where you were handed a big plastic D12 that has magnets on it, and you have, or I think metal plates, and then you have a bunch of magnets that are different biomes that you use to build your planet trying to make um, a habitable, habitable world for the animal cards that are up. And the animal cards change every game. So like one animal might be score the number of different biomes and another one might be for your largest desert or whatever. And the impressive part in that game is you get to see ahead. So it's all, not just about placing the right tile for now. It's also about planning ahead for those longer turns and the long-term strategy. I, this is way deeper than it should be. I see people recommending this as a kid's game, and I'm like, no, I can see playing this with 18xx gamers. Like, there, there's enough strategy in this game that I think players of all ages will dig it. Now, yes, you could play with kids who just kind of do it and just focus on what they have to score now, but, like, the real joy I had with that game was playing it the second time. Like, the first time seeing just how much that end game, well, not end game scoring, later game scoring mattered. So at 40.59, leaving me with 9.47 for a set of Chessex dice would be Planet from Blue Orange Games. Nice. Uh, I actually also went with a, uh, found a solo, uh, sing one single game for the, uh, the, to fill out on my third slot. And that one is Azul Summer Pavilion, uh, which is, again, the second best, I think, game. Azul is great. Azul Summer Pavilion is fantastic. Azul Stained Glass, yeah. Um, it has its ups and downs. Uh, but Azul Summer Pavilion at forty-eight fifty-nine is a solid deal for a really, really enjoyable game. Yeah. No, I, I, I cannot fault you for that one. And to be I would fair, be on my list if I didn't have it. To be fair, I would consider that one lightly competitive and possibly even something that Dave and his, uh, the Dave's group could go for. Hey, worry about the heat drafting. Mm. heat drafting from that market in azul can get nasty that, that's that's what i worry about now now summer pavilion is the least yeah because that's... there's that bonus market where you can still get the tiles right but it, i don't know that 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 one aspect of the game is what i worry about sure my next possible cart would include mariposas and the mind extreme Mary Posas is the not the second game by elizabeth hargrove but her follow-up wingspan the, the the first game she released after her big hit of wingspan she did um tussie musky before wingspan which i hear is really good mary posa's honestly is something that interests me because it happens to be that living in windsor essex we're actually right along the monarch butterfly migration that happens every year and one of the things i remember doing as a kid is going to point peely provincial park to go see the monarchs so I have a tie to this game because that's what Mary Posis is about, is about the monarch migration every year. I've heard it's a really good game. It's rather nice looking, though kind of abstract. Um, nice cards, not not as much uh, hype as there is out there for Wingspan, but I hear it's actually a really solid game. 
The Mind Extreme is not just the way we played The Mind the first time, but a new, more difficult version and quicker version of The Mind. I'm a big fan of The Mind. I have not played Extreme, but you know what? With the money I have left over from Mariposas, I'm more than willing to give it a shot and see how it compares to the original. Fair enough. Now, the next one I went with is uh, arguably a questionable choice. Uh, we don't like to necessarily talk about uh, this as much as we once did for various reasons, but Hogwarts Battle Charms and Potions expansion is the one that I'm still missing, and it's a game my kids still love. Yep. So, problematic or not, the game exists, and it's on shelves, um, and again, we really enjoy the game and the theme of it. Uh, and then that one is at forty one ninety nine, which gives just enough for another sort of small game, left center right tin for seven ninety nine, bringing in a total of forty nine ninety eight for two games. See, personally, the questionable one there is left center right, in my opinion. <laughs> Because to be honest, Hogwarts, it's already the distributor already had it. It's already been purchased by the game store at this point. The problematic person has already been paid for it. So fair enough. And your kids enjoy the game. And that's actually what's more important. Now, left center, right? I personally think is a terrible game. It's all horrible. It's pure random. Uh, it's it, the only reason it becomes a game is because you put betting. You have to add betting to it to make it a game. And even then it's still random. But at least a betting element makes it a challenge or something. Something for the kids in the backseat. <laughs> yeah i guess because the tin you can do uh you can do it portable so oh there the, you go the tin yeah, makes it a good you know what game. kids are probably like it at least it's not determined at the start of the game it's just 100 percent random literally 100 yeah, yeah. random there is there are no actual decisions really made in lcr yeah all right my final shopping cart from brimstone games would be a copy of just one and a copy of age of war both games we have recommended and have been on honorable mention lists on various game uh suggestion episodes of ours because i don't own them uh just one being the party game where you're trying to guess a clue and everyone's giving in one word clues but if you duplicate a clue it's eliminated because that's why it's the just one you can only have one clue one of each clue so it may be if you're trying to guess chocolate and someone says ice cream, ice cream, ice cream, candy bar, candy bar, you now have to guess chocolate with absolutely zero clues whatsoever. Uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. I've heard really good things. Age of War is um, the, the dice rolling Yahtzee style game where you're rolling dice and you get to re-roll up to two times. You place the dice on cards. And when you fill a card with the die, with all the dice, you get to claim it. Um, very similar to King of the Dice or Roll for It. But this one has a samurai theme uh, with some little additional rules where you have to complete battles in certain orders and so on. It's a really basic system I've seen in a number of games, but this is one of the ones that I find does it better than the others, especially with, the, I, I dig the theme of samurais. So that is my final shopping cart using $50 Canadian at Brimstone Games. And to wrap up for me, I decided I wanted to go with something outside the box, something on that list that I didn't really know about, but but looked pretty solid from a quick glance of Board Game Geek. Uh, one of the things that Dave asked about was, you know, where else can we go? And mm -hmm. Board Game Great Geek is a pretty solid way, uh, if perhaps slow, to go through <laughs> if you, <laughs> you've got to go through enough games. But uh, I have seen this game before and I checked out and it looks interesting enough. And that is Holly Festival of Colors, representing the Indian Festival of Colors with the uh, the powdered colors mm -hmm. everywhere. And that comes in at forty six fifty nine, and seems like a solid uh, idea for if you're going to go, you know, right out of the blue, let's pick something that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Holly Festival of Colors was it. Yeah, that one definitely caught my eye. I don't know much about it, but it does look like a solid game. Ratings aren't terrible. Yeah. So now there is one other part of Dave's question Sean just kind of alluded to where he said, do you know of sites where I can visit to do further research? Well, one of the best sites I hear that's out there on the internet is tabletopbellhop.com. If you go there, there's people talking about all kinds of gaming recommendations, including cooperative games and party games and best games and best games for under $50. Though so in that case, it was about U.S., now, we know and love that site really well. It's near and dear to our heart. There is, of course, as Sean mentioned, Board Game Geek and its newest competitor, Board Game Atlas. Now, Board Game Atlas has a feature that you don't see on Board Game Geek that I kind of dig and I'm now involved with, so there's a bit of disclosure there, is when you bring up a game there, they show everyone's review of the game underneath, and what they have is a set of what they call it, featured reviewers, I think. I'm forgetting the term. Uh, they have a set of featured reviewers, and, well, I'm one of those. But so is Tom Vassell, so is Rado. Like there's a bunch of well-named 
board game reviewers who have become members of that site were invited. We were, they sent us invites. We were not compensated for this, nor were they getting anything for us except links to our review. Accredited, there you go, accredited reviewers, they call it. So if you bring up a game there, you'll get to see the top three reviews from accredited reviewers and then everyone else's review in an aggregate. So what this site's trying to do a little more than Board Game Geek is be an aggregate of reviews from multiple places instead of just being a rating of one to 10. Plus it's more granular, everything's rated one to 100. Right. So that is the other place I would recommend. So tabletopbellhop.com, Board Game Atlas and Board Game Geek. Interestingly, when you actually go to the pages on Board Game Atlas, uh, well accredited I believe really was the correct term uh, they call them under the under the game. They call them critics and community. Okay, so critics. Yeah, Is it accredited critics, accredited critics. No, nope, right, it's so just critics. <laughs> so Tom Vassell, Richard Ham, you know. Yeah, it's Prado. Yeah. What's weird is it? Oh, yeah, they don't say I'm accredited here. Yeah. Even the link you sent, D, it says board game review critics. Mm -hmm. So they took out the accredited term. But well, I when guess, I joined, it said accredited. Yeah. So I guess they accredited a bunch of people and then locked it down, maybe? Who knows? Oh, wow. We have 26 followers there. We yeah. are not the bottom of the pile. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, head over to Board Game Atlas to their critics page and give us a follow. That's, that's kind of strange that they worded it that way. So yeah, and, and otherwise, the one thing I did find a problem with Rimstone's site is you can filter by keyword, but it filtered by cooperative and it only showed four games. So whoever did their keyword like ranking or whatever obviously didn't do it. I doubt they did it manually. It's probably something automatic from their distributor or something. It did not list all of the cooperative games. Right. The pandemic legacy wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. That's a shame. And well, honestly, like almost any board game site, go on Amazon and you can filter by uh, no board game. Amazon, I don't think does filter by cooperative. Mm, you could try again. I, yeah, I don't think yeah, it does. I'd, uh... Other, <laughs> other selling sites, but like Board Game Geek's your best bet, right? Go to Board Game Geek, click on Mechanic Cooperative, sort by rating, look at the top. You can't sort by price. That, that's your that's what you're not going to get from Board Game Geek, but you are going to get from Board Game Atlas because Board Game Atlas does list online game price. But those will be in American. So yeah. well, no, there's a Canadian. You can oh, click the Canadian oh, button excellent. and then oh, browse everything Canadian. You can also do EU or Australia or Germany. It's they are they are trying to be a competitor from Board Game Geek. I, I think there's even a way to log your collection. It's I haven't dived into that, those aspects of this. All right. I think that's it. I hope Dave found some games to go shopping for. Um, the actual comment I got from Dave was, we'll bring this to the group and see what they have to say. So I'm actually looking forward to what, what we'll do is if I do get feedback from Dave, we'll follow up on a uh, future suggestion box segment. Uh, find out what Dave bought. And remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to a look at a card-driven train game, Yardmaster. Yardmaster was designed by Stephen Aramini and features art and graphic design from Daryl Lauder and Dan Thompson. Now, Yardmaster was successfully kickstarted back in 2014. You don't hear many games that were kickstarted back then and published in North America by Crash Games. Interestingly, since then, it has been rethemed and republished as Aramimi Circus in most of Europe, but not republished here in North America. Now, Yardmaster plays two to five players, games taking under half an hour. Uh, I'd say 15 minutes is probably the average. And this small box game has a nice low MSRP of $19.99 US dollars. Now, Yardmaster was awarded the 2015 Mensa Recommended Award and also won the 2014 Best Light Game Award from ION. In Yardmaster, you control a freight yard trying to get your cargo train loaded first by being the first player to hit a set goal of points. You do this by collecting cargo cards and then trading them in to purchase rail cards. These rail cards are each worth one to four points, but can only be added to your existing train if either the color or cargo type of the car or the point value matches the last car on your train. Rail cards that don't match go into your sorting yard and can be added to your train on future turns. I gotta say, this sounds much more interesting as a train game to me than connecting train routes across a map. 
Though I am sure there are train gamers out there that would argue this still isn't officially a train game. But for our thoughts on that, you can check out our What is a Train Game podcast episode. Now, the European version of this game, uh, the Aramini, Aramini Circus, is the exact same game. Like It has the exact same cards, the exact same distribution of cards. There's no change in the rules, but a change in the theme. So instead of using rail cards, you are in charge of a traveling circus where you're adding animal cars to your growing circus train. Now, what this version does feature is very colorful and cartoony artwork to go along with this theme change. Now, I guess they haven't noticed that uh, circuses are kind of a really bad and exploitive form of entertainment these days. Yeah, uh, maybe that's different in the EU. They take care of the animals more. I don't actually know. (laughs) I do think it's an odd choice, and it seems like an odd game to market to kids, uh, to be honest. This is not as light a game as I would try to sell to kids. Now, since I got my copy of Yardmaster by buying it off another local gamer, I don't have an unboxing video to share with you as we normally would. But what I will say here is the components are what you would expect. They're, they're not above and beyond, and they're nothing to complain about. The game does come in a very sturdy, small rectangular box, really thick cardboard. Like, I don't know what they expect you to just stack on this thing, but you could use this as, you know, a support piece in your house. Uh, The inside of the box is divided into three sections. The first holds cargo cards, the middle has a bunch of tokens, and the last one holds the rail car and engine card. So you got three different decks really, like everyone gets a rail card and then you have two main decks to shuffle them up. Card quality here is excellent. Um, I personally love the minimalist art style they went for in the original version of the game. Now the new one like is more of a, oh, what's that? But man, it looks cluttered. Whereas this is highly functional, Very easy to see from across the table between both iconography and color differences for people who may have vision issues. All right. Well, now that we know what you get in a copy of Yardmaster, how about you give us an overview of play? All right. This one's not very complicated at all. You're going to start the game with an engine. You place it down in front of you. You're going to shuffle up the rail cars and put out a FARC four card market. You then randomly give each player an exchange token, placing any remaining ones in the center of the table. Shuffle the cargo card deck and deal five to each player. Then flip over to the top card and place it as a starting discard pile, which you'll recognize from a bunch of popular traditional card games. The player who last rode a train is the start player. The player to the right of that start player gets the Yardmaster token. Or just use Schwazi because stupid first player systems are stupid. (laughs) We all know Sean's opinion on that (laughs) one. Now, each turn, you're going to take two actions. You can do the same action twice. Or you can do less than two. It's up to two. It's may. You may take two actions. First action is draw a cargo card, add it to your hand. This can come from the top of the cargo deck or from the top of the discard pile. That's interesting that the discard pile is as good as the deck here. That's not something you see often in games. Yes, and it's important because when you buy a rail card, you discard a number of cargo cards of the appropriate type equal to the score value of the rail car you wish to purchase. Anything you discard is now available from someone else to take. So the order you discard in can matter. Now, there are five types of cargos and five matching types of rail cars. Rail cars come in value of one to four, but they're distributed so there's only one four and there's four ones and the other two are equally spread out. Now, rail cars, um, when you purchase your rail cards, you can also use your exchange token. Now, your exchange token lets you trade in two to one of one specific good. So you can trade in two of a red for a yellow if you have the appropriate exchange token. So your usual sort of market. Now, your final choice of action is to swap that exchange token. You can either swap the one you have with another player, or if there are less than five players, you can swap with one of the tokens in the center of the table. Note at all times, each player can only have one exchange token and will always have one exchange token. So the exchange tokens are unique as there's only one for each type of cargo. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the right token to make the right exchange you're looking for which is yep. why you might use that or action to trade around uh, so that you can line up that big play later yep. on. Now, after buying a rail car, if it's your first rail car you bought, you just attach it to your train. If it matches the color or type or the value of the last card in your train, it must be added to your growing train. So first one you buy has to get added, but then the next one only gets added if it matches either the number or the color. And the color also represents a type, like yellow is green. 
Now, any rail car bot that doesn't connect your train immediately goes into what's called your sorting yard. So just a tableau in front of you. Now, after adding a rail car to your train, later turns, you always have to check. So you add a new one to your train, you have to check to see if anything in your sorting yard can then be added to your train. And after you add that one, you have to see if anything else in your sorting yard can keep being added. And you have to add any cards that can legally now connect. Note, you can do in that in any order of your choosing. So you can kind of break the combo if you're wanting to save up for something later. So it's like playing crazy eights with trains. Yeah. You're trying to get a chain of colors and or values stacked up in your yard that will, if all goes well, line up all at once when you get that one right card to trigger a cascade. And they all, all the, all the uh, box cars chug, chug, chug out of your yard and slam into the back of the train. Yes. This is the game of shunting trains, really. If you've ever watched a train car shunt, usually while you're waiting to get somewhere important, that's what you're doing in this game. Now, in addition to this, there are 10 bonus cards in the cargo deck. When you draw one of these, they go into your hand like normal. They then can be played on a later turn. Now, playing one of these bonus cards does not take one of your two actions. These let you do some type of one-time advantage. You play it, you do the thing. These include things like exchanging cargo cards one for one, so it's better than your normal exchange rate, getting free actions, taking a card from the cargo discard pile, and more. There are 10 of these. They're clearly explained in the rule book. I'm not going to get into all 10 here. Now, when one of these cards is played, this is important. They're on placed on top of the discard pile. Now, these cannot be picked up. So remember when you take the draw action, you can pick from the top of the deck or the discard, but you can't if it's one of these bonus cards. To remind you of that, there's a giant red X on these to remind you you can't draw them. Well, free actions are always nice. Now, we mentioned earlier that the player to the right of the start player gets a yard master token. What this is, is they're the yard master this turn. They have an extra bonus action. So instead of two, they can take up to three actions. There's a, it's a two-sided token. You can flip it to show if you've taken your action if you want, but most of the time it's pretty easy to remember. Now, at the end of the round, Start player passes to the left, like normal. You go clockwise. But the yard master token passes to the right. Now, the game ends immediately when a player hits the point total, which is placed on the player count. And your score is the total value of all the cars in your actual train, not counting the cars in your yard. Those haven't been added to your train yet. Right. So just, again, it's weird that the uh, your, your yard master token is not your first player token. Mm -hmm. It goes in the opposite direction of the first player around the yes. circle. And to be honest, that is the hardest thing to get right. If oh, you're I used bet. to playing any <laughs> other game, you're going to screw yeah. this one up at first. Because your first seems... game is going to be extreme because you're going to think Yardmaster means start player, and it's not. Yeah, it, it, it just seems that way. It, it, yeah. it really does. Now, there are some minor changes of playing with only two players, and they're all about the Yardmaster token. So I mentioned earlier, Yardmaster token is two-sided. Well, what happens is you pass it to the other player and it starts on the back side. Then on their turn, they just get to flip it to the front side. So basically it takes a turn to charge up. So it's not like I get three actions and you get three actions. It's I get two actions, you get two actions, I get three, you get two, I get two, you get three. And again, you're tracking this with the token. Other than that, gameplay is identical, though I will note the two and three player tokens, uh, two and three player game requires more points than the three or four or five player game. All right, well, uh, now we have a good idea of how to play. What are your thoughts on this card-driven train game? So to be honest, I'm going to start with my thoughts on an earlier game. Uh, well, actually, it's not an earlier game. They were released at the same time. But my first experience with Yardmaster wasn't this game. Instead, it's the even simpler, quicker game called Yardmaster Express. Now, this is from the same publisher, Clash Games. was also Kickstarted, but this is from a completely different designer. Yardmaster Express is a drafting game like Seven Wonders or Sushi Go where you get a hand of cards, pick one card to add to your train and pass your hand to the next player. There's no tokens, there's no cargo cards, there's no purchasing, there's no market. Instead, you're just playing cards right from your hand. Now, the train building rules are the same. When playing that card from your hand, it has to match either the value or the number of the one you just played. So the twist here is that if it doesn't, you play it face down and it's a wild card that works, but it's worth way less points. So Express is a super light filler. Uno is actually a heavier game than Yardmaster Express. I, that has to be based on Board Game Geek. I don't know on that <laughs> one. I, I actually think Yardmaster Express may be, I, I think some train game fans rated the weight on that a little lower. There is some definite strategy in Yardmaster Express, especially when you know what you passed, right? If you're playing four players and you have five cards, you know you're getting one of those back. You don't get that in Uno. Uno, Uno. 
So I, I personally think it's a little higher than Uno. But yes, it is way lighter than this. I, I like Yardmaster Expedition. I actually really enjoy it. Um, it was my friend, Sean knows him too, uh, John Salila, who taught me how to play Yardmaster Express. Game pay is super quick, though. Like, it's lightning quick and short, like five minutes to play around with that. Like, you literally are getting a hand of cards. You're passing them so many times and someone wins. Um, it's fun. Like, for five minutes, it's fun. But I like games with a bit more meat on them, and I think everyone's well aware of that. That's why when Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, listed his copy of the full version up for sale on Facebook, I got to hold him right away and said, I got to have it. And he was happy to give it to me because he knows he'll be able to play it whenever he wants because I game with Sean pretty often. Well, at least I used to when we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. So I finally got to try this out and I am so glad I got this off Sean. And I know he regrets selling it to me to a point because every time I share a picture of this online, Sean's like, oh, I shouldn't have given that game up. You know what? It's still here. We can still play. Fair enough. So this is still a filler game, but yeah. it has upped that complexity beyond Uno uh, with an economy and more. Yeah. I, to be honest, this is exactly what I want, right? Like I knew this was a more complicated version of Yardmaster Express, and that's exactly what it is. It's Yardmaster Express with more decision points, more tactical options, more long-term strategy. While I like Yardmaster Express, I love Yardmaster. I am really been enjoying this one lately. It is still not a heavy game though, right? This is still a quick to teach, easy to learn game. Like I just did it. Like I, I, I'm pretty sure I just taught you how to play without, the only thing I didn't do was explain what the five, 10 different special cards are, but they say what they do right on them. For such an easy to learn game though, Yardmaster has a surprising amount of depth. And quite a bit of this depth is um, like kind of hidden under the covers. You probably won't even notice it your first couple plays, but it starts to sink in once you start realizing what's going on. And the biggest distinction is the distribution of the cards. When you actually learn that, wait a minute, there's only one four of every color and wait, there's four ones and you start card counting. That's when you really start to see the depth of this game. Yeah. So one thing to note is that the lower rating of Yardmaster on board game geek has been impacted mostly by two factors from looking mm -hmm. into it. Uh, one People who like train games and thought this was one, but decided otherwise. Yeah. And two, people who thought it would be more complex than it is and just hate on filler games. Yeah, I, I, by putting Yardmaster in, if I remember the Kickstarter even had like Master of the Rails or something like that as a subtitle, which didn't end up in the final version of the game. I think there were some players out there that were hoping 18xx in card game for. And no, that's not what this is. Now, what I will say is your first couple games of this, when I first played it, I just played. Like, I had no clue what the distribution was. Heck, I didn't even click in that there are five types of cargo, one for each player. So if you're playing five players, there's and there's one exchange token for each side. Like, that makes sense, but I just don't think of it, right? By the time you play your third game, though, you're going to know that the number of cards there are, and you're going to know how many are left in the deck, especially by mid-game. If you're not counting cards, you're not playing this game properly. You have to be looking at everyone and going, all right, what are my chances of getting the three of yellow? I know there's only two threes of yellow. Sean's got one. Does someone have one in their hand or is it still in the deck? All right, well, I'm going to use this card that lets me search through the deck to see if it's in there. Oh, it's not in there. Oh, someone's holding on to that damn three. So now I know my three's going nowhere. So I'm going to have to change that three to a blue because otherwise I'm never going to finish my train and so on. It's that de level of depth that you're eventually going to find. And another way that Yardmaster surprised me is the variety of different strategies that all seem to work, though all of them seem to be based on adapting your strategy to how the other players are playing. Like in the situation I just said, holding on to that three and knowing you're waiting for the three yellow and having changed what you were going to do. Like I have played a game where I tried to win just by collecting one cards and I got to say it almost worked. Because one cards are only cost you one resource to buy. They're dirt cheap. If you've got an exchange token, you could use two cards to get them. And while they're easy to combo, every one connects to another one, and there's a ton in the decks. But the other way is you could be the person going for the fours. Yeah, the fours aren't cheap, and there's only what, five of them in the entire deck. But like getting to the point total of 16, you only need four of those four cards to win the game. And again, we're not talking about a thinky Euro here. Well, no. For a filler card game, it's got some real decision points. Now, the sorting yard mechanic is honestly the best part about this game. Like, not only is it a very valid way to collect cars, you can also use it to collect cars you know the other players want. That's one of those steps above, right? The, the next level strategy in the game is 
not only am I going to try to set up that massive combo, like Sean suggested earlier, when your whole train yard comes out at once and you just run away with the game, it's also a really good way to notice that player is looking for a yellow three. Throw that into your train yard and give the other player a nice and, and watch for the dirty look from the other player when you put it in there. Um, I love that shorting yard mechanic. And I love the calm behind wins that have come from it. And it just feels so good. Like, like if you're a player where you've got like only two or three cars out, meanwhile, someone else is like, their train's taking up so much room on the table, they've had to start a second row. And then all of a sudden you got it set up so that if I just get the blue three, then I can play my green three, then I can play my green two, my green two, my green one, my green one, my blue one, my yellow one, my red one, my red three, boom. And then it's just such a great moment. It is so much fun. That also, though, is where adapting your strategy is so important because you look at other players' train yards. It's all open information, right? Nothing's hidden here except the cards in your hands. And you're looking at that going, oh, you know what? If he just gets a blue two, he's going to be able to play his blue two, his green three, his blah, 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 blah. So I have to make sure they don't get one. And I got to say, that's one of those things that when you realize it, all the other players are going to be hunting for that specific card to make sure that one player doesn't get it. And nothing says fun game like ganging up on people. <laughs> Though really, even if you don't actively coordinate, it's just good gameplay to deny someone what they want if you can. Yes, and I will say to tie back to something we said earlier in this episode today, this is not a game I would recommend for Mr. Dave Hutchinson and his group. Now, this is what I love about this game. It's this tactical, instant, what do I do with what's in my hands, combined with the strategy of I'm going to grab that three for later because I know I have this bonus card that's going to let me do the thing, right? That combination of tactics and strategy that keeps me coming back and playing Yardmaster again and again. Like, honestly, right now, this is at the very top of my favorite filler game list. Now, I'll admit, I'm, just, I'm into it right now. It'll probably fade and there'll be other fillers that will come and go. But right now, if I'm like, oh, we have some time to kill, let's play some Yardmaster. And I got to say, every time we sit down and play, we don't just play Yardmaster once. It's like, no, let's play again. Or let's play again. It's usually two or three rounds in a row when I break it out. So overall, I dig it. I really dig Yardmaster. But I also like Yardmaster Express. And I recommend Yardmaster Express. It is a fun light trade game. It's nothing compared to the full game. This isn't that long. Like, like you're, you're maybe doubling the time of Yardmaster Express for a better game, in my opinion. This is a quick-to-learn, easy-to-teach, card-based train game with surprising depth and strategy. If you're looking for a new thinky filler, I don't think you can go wrong with this game. If you're a fan of train games, this offers up a very different approach to the train game theme. Now, earlier, Sean mentioned Ticket to Ride. And not Well, he didn't mention Ticket to Ride, but he mentioned building routes with your trains. If you're into those kind of games, or if you're a Ticket to Ride fan, I have a feeling your group will also dig this train game. Especially due to the fact that in Ticket to Ride, you are using cars to buy, you're, you're using cards to buy trains. Well, you do the exact same thing here, right? You're using your cargo cards to purchase rail cars. So that mechanic is going to be the same. So will the market being similar, right? Having four cards you can purchase from is also going to feel similar to Ticket to Ride players. And again, just be aware of what you're getting. It is a light filler card game. So, you know, don't expect that high decision point you know verging on 18xx train game yes it's just a filler game yeah if you're one of those people who think that only play real train games and real train games are only games with stock portfolios and rope building you're not gonna like this game this isn't for you uh though personally i love heavy train games i, I haven't done a lot of 18xx games but i'm a huge fan of steam um, and I love Yardmaster. I, I think this is a great filler with a similar theme. And I got to say, it's perfect for a train game night. Like this is a perfect game to wrap up after your 18X game. You just played 18XX games for 15 hours. Now you sit down and play a Yardmaster and have a beer with the group and relax and talk about how, man, if I had only sold this stock one turn earlier, I would have had a bigger portfolio and I would have took president and I would have, you know, that kind of conversation you have after an 18XX game. Now, I have seen a uh, suggestions that the European circus version is too cartoonish mm. and harder to take seriously as a result. So that is one thing to keep in mind for some of our uh, non-North American uh, listeners. Yeah, if you if you are trying to sell this game to an 18xx fan, you probably want to stick away from the cartoon circus game. Like, honestly, this is one of those games that's up there. Like, it's one of those games I think everyone should try. Even if you're not a fan of train games normally, this really is just an abstract game with a train theme. The mechanics are dead simple and easy to learn, but they interact in a neat way. 
And I think everyone is going to find joy in doing a nice three plus card combo from your sorting yard to your train, especially if that's where you get that come from behind win. Now, the only problem I do have with this game, which often happens on our show, and I didn't do the research before I started working on the review, and I apologize for talking this game up so much, is that you're going to have a hard time finding this one, at least the North American version. It looks like it's currently out of print. I looked around. I checked a bunch of my normal sources. I even checked sites like Noble Knight Games, who sells out of print games. They don't even have a copy of this right now. Now, while I can find Aramimi Circus, in Europe stores, but also like uh, Board Game Bliss has a copy available. So people have been importing that version over here. I'm not seeing any copies of the original for sale. That said, I do have some good news. You can get the game for free. There is a free print and play version on Board Game Geek, a legit from Mind Clash or from uh, Crash Games. This isn't someone's pirated copy. Crash Games, as part of their Kickstarter for the game, released the print-and-play version of Yardmaster for free. So you know what? If you want to play Yardmaster, it's just going to cost you some ink and some paper, and you might want to put it on a little thicker card. You can print up and play your own copy. Not only is this a great way to get this out of print game, once it is back in print, this is a great way to try it before buying well, that's it for our review of Yardmaster. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review of this of this uh, game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, on the Bellhop Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played or not since we the last episode. Yeah, I haven't checked these notes since I wrote them earlier this morning to see if Sean had anything to add here, but I have a feeling it's been a rough week. So I am still dealing with a medical issue that has kept me away from the physical game table. So all I've got this week is more board game arena plays. And honestly, I don't have a lot to say about those because we just talked about them on our last episode. Uh, so Sean and I continue to play patchwork on and off. Sean finally won his Ooh. first game. We're definitely getting better. Yep. What I find interesting in that game is our, our scores are close, but like sometimes we're in like the 20s and 30s, but then the next game will be like zero to three. Yeah. It, it's... it's so odd the way that game plays out. I, I still would say we both suck at it, I think. I, I, I don't think we are good at playing patchwork. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm playing. I, my list is even down. I'm not playing as nearly as many games. And, and some of the games I've played uh, have changed. Like I'm now playing, uh, you know, so, uh, still playing sushi go but now go nut for do go nuts for donuts has replaced some of the games and we have okay. we haven't done a we haven't done a uh, seven wonders in a while which i is kind of refreshing to be fair um yeah but, i don't uh, i don't know what happened if, if eric kicked us out or what did we offend him but yeah like we, we haven't had deanna's missing the terra mystica she's like where's the terra mystica okay, i'm still playing with a bunch of eric games it's just we we got, sort of got rid of some of the ones that we've been playing since we started playing yeah. board game arena we, so. we need to start playing the other ones. Yeah, Nana can't start. Oh, well, you just that's a remind me one. then, because Bo's not always at the computer, but I'm always around. And I yeah, you should start another one. Yeah, I'll start one. Um, we did finish a game of Clans of Caledonia and started a new one. I that one's good. Like it is really well done on Board Game Arena. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Terra Mystica. Which, I my box insert. Speaking of which, Terra Mystica uh, now has expansions. Uh, the different boards available. Okay. I just saw that. I, I don't even know. I, I know there's two expansions for that game that I've never picked up. So <laughs> it's it's one of those things I should, but like, actually, I play the game all the time on Board Game Arena. I never played my physical copy. There was a time where I was supposed to teach at how to play Terra Mystica because she had it on her pile of shame and hadn't played it. I don't even know if that's still true. I should confirm that. Um, the other one is Castles of Burgundy. We have been playing, or we finished a game of that, started another game of that. I am playing so much better having played the physical version and I'm understanding playing, better what's going I'm on. I am playing worse thinking I knew what know what's going on. Oh, <laughs> so Sean I, still hasn't figured it out. Apparently, well, apparently I, I, I was doing far better when I had no idea what I was doing. A tiny little bit of knowledge is not helpful in this game. All right. No, I'm still digging it. I, I am enjoying it. I am getting tempted to upgrade my physical copy a little bit at this point, though I probably won't. I am getting even more tempted to pick up the new edition because it ends up the new edition has some of the expansions. And I've been looking at what they've added and I'm like, oh, that's like totally new stuff I've never seen. And people are saying that they always play with certain ones of these expansions. So I'm getting tempted, though I'm probably going to put it aside because <laughs> there's new stuff and new games. Castle of Burgundy's old. 
He and I should try a two-player, though. I, people say it's the best two-player felt. Mm-hmm. We should try a two-player, because it's supposed to be like lightning quick, going back and forth, and you can play a game in like 15, 20 minutes. And for anyone, yeah. anyone who does care, King of Tokyo is now on Board Game Arena. I, that's such a highly random game that like my enjoyment of that game is the player interaction not the role in the yahtzee dice or buying the right power-ups I, I can't see that one being all that enjoyable i would rather see the the oh, what's the new york king of new york is that the the one with the advanced rules i think so where you're like taking out military units and stuff that to me would be a better board game arena game. and then yeah, board game arena Parks is the, the other. Parks is the other one that just dropped, uh, yeah. which they were they, close to the philosophy of Takedo. So maybe that's one we should give a try. Yeah, Parks is supposed to be good. I, I it played so not going to cons hurt. Like just from my overall knowledge of board games that are out there, I'm like two years behind on everything. I'm like usually I can talk about games because I've at least like you know sat through a playthrough or watched a demo or or own it. Um, also like so far. I think I'm going to hit the end of 2021 without having bought a single game this year. So that'd probably be the first game in 20 years. <laughs> first year in 20 years, I haven't bought a game. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that is going on for those of you who are here live is free RPG days this weekend. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the chat still from Windsor is still around. There were some in the earlier uh, CD realm is taking part. So you can head down to the CD realm and Check out their free RPG day activities, which are you can come shop at the store and get free RPGs because they are not doing open gaming at this point. I did confirm because I thought maybe Ian be running a game or something. He used to do it where they would run the games that there were free RPG. I used to be involved in that and I would run them. That's how I got into Marvel Heroic Role Playing. So no online playing. Um, I'm thinking we might stop in just to support the store. It's been so long. Go in, pick up something small. I don't know. I don't have a $50 gift card. I think Deanna does have a gift card, though. So I might go in there and pick up something. Though using a gift card, I guess, doesn't currently support the store. And I supported them in the past. Yeah. And check out what's... I, I honestly have no idea what's up for offer for this year's free RPG day. Like, none at all. There's usually something from Dungeon Crawl Classics. That's what I'd probably be most interested in. Yeah. And, well, you may as well. Yeah. So uh, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Actual gaming. Uh, Friday Night Gaming is on. Um, we're going to do some face-to-face gaming with Tori and Kat. We'll be coming over, so expect to see some amusing pictures on social media because it's always a good time when they come over. Um, the plans are to play Space Space with fully unlocked Pluto at least once. I'm hoping twice. And then possibly review it next weekend or next week, next Wednesday, or, or the week after. It'll be one or the other. Uh, so Space Space with Shy Pluto. And roll camera. Uh, I want to get that back to the table. I've only played it once so far, and I would like to get in a couple rounds of that. Um, I don't know if we're heading over on Sunday as well. I don't know if that's actually part of the plans, but if it is, I would also like to play the same games. So, so my goal is to play one of these enough to review it on Wednesday and possibly both, but I don't think we're going to jump into two reviews in a week. Now, along with that, I do have something new over there, but you're going to have to stick around to the after show to see what that is. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Sheehan. Thanks, Brian. And good to see you in the level up chat. Trying to do some self-improvement, something I need to get back to once this heals up. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz. Thanks to another Brian. We're starting to collect them. You, Rutila. Thank you. And Jeff Seuss. Thanks, as always, Jeff and Sheila. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and it's time to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below and leave reviews where you can. That would be awesome. Like, subscribe, hit the bell, all that fun stuff that makes us feel validated. The even bigger thing you do, if you like the content we're providing and want to support us improving the show, continuing the show, pay for server space and continued upgrades. Trust me, I went through all 615 of our YouTube videos, those old ones. Oh my God, how much the lights help. Wow. And man, have we gotten gray over the years. (laughs) You can support us through 
Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Every single patron gets access to a private Discord server and other cool perks. Now, before we go, one more quick shout out to our sponsor, Crowd Games. That's with a capital C and a capital D. Be sure to check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter launching Tuesday. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch, now testing on YouTube. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.